Welcome. I'm Sherry Goodman, Director of Education at the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive. And I'm truly delighted to welcome you to our program today, a conversation about color, which, as you might imagine or already know, is occasioned by our current matrix exhibition of the work of the Swiss-born artist Rudolf de Crenius, organized by our chief curator, Lucinda Barnes. Uh, <clears throat> BAMPFA director Lawrence Rinder uh, is joined today by Karen Schloss in what I anticipate will be an exploration as well as even an explanation of the effects of color that are compelling and elusive, among other adjectives we might use, in the work of de Crenius. And uh, actually, they are pretty ideal conversants for this topic. Uh, Larry, given his acute aesthetic sensitivity to the color of de Crenius, um, as expressed in his foreword uh, of the new magnificent monograph of de Crenius's work, which is available at our bookstore. Uh, and Karen, given her definitive expertise in the field of color perception per se. Karen Schloss uh, is currently post a postdoctoral researcher in the Palmer Visual Perception and Aesthetics Lab in the psychology department here at UC Berkeley where she earned her PhD in 2011. Her current research uh, focuses on people's um, aesthetic responses to color, how and why they respond as they do. Uh, starting this summer, Karen will be a research professor at Brown University. Um, on a more personal note, I wanted to share that Karen told me that her fascination with color is a lifelong thing, <laughs> that as a small child, she would spend time organizing and reorganizing her box of 96 colored crayons in different arrangements and that by comparison, dolls were boring. <laughs> so we're really happy to have her here today. And uh, again, or if I didn't mention, there will be a book signing of the monograph I mentioned earlier after the program. Uh, but right now, the conversation about color. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you, and welcome, everybody. Hello, Karen. Hello. Hello. Um, so first of all, I want to, to start by defining our terms. Uh, you work at the visual perception and um, aesthetics lab at UC Berkeley. And the first time I heard this phrase, the aesthetics lab, I got very scared because I, I thought, <laughs> oh my god, they're figuring out what it is. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and I'm not involved. <laughs> So what is the aesthetics lab, and how do you define aesthetics over there? So we study human aesthetic Thank response. You. So when you perceive a color or some sort of spatial arrangement, it's... Can you the word for the I'm just going to hold it. Well, how's that? Okay? All right. Good? Hooray! Okay. <laughs> so, well, that's really loud. Is that okay? Okay. It's loud to me. Um, so when you see a color, it's this dimension of experience from, wow, I love it, this is wonderful, to, oh, that's disgusting, I hate it. And that's what we mean by human aesthetic response. So it's our aesthetic experience to perceiving, in this case, visual displays. But uh, is it, I mean, when we speak of aesthetics in the visual arts or in poetics, uh, the, the term can mean more than just I like it or don't like it. Um, uh, in fact, uh, I think typically it's, it doesn't mean just that. It means I like it in this way uh, or, um, you know, qualities of, of liking. So in your case, is it, uh, does, do you get into those things? You know, I, I like it like I like, uh, you know, walnuts or I like it like I like peanuts or is it more just I like it or I don't like it? I think it's more the experience of, ooh, I like it, versus not. So you can distinguish it from a different type of preference. So um, 
people have preferences for everything in the world, but some of them are positive preferences, some are negative, and some are relatively neutral, and some are based on other motivations. So if I ask you which um, shirt you want to wear, and it's 40 degrees outside, and I give you a choice between a tank top and a heavy coat, mm -hmm. um, you're probably going to pick the heavy coat, even if it's the worst color for even you, and I, you hate it, the color. It, right. right, so that's a choice based on utility. Um, right. with the motivation to be warm. And so in the sort of aesthetic response that we're talking about, it's um, your experience of how, how much you like to look at it, so how, how appealing the, the experience is for you. Okay. Uh, and I know you've, you've written many papers, and there's one in particular that I wanted you to talk about because it's really relevant to our, our site here, the effects of university affiliation and school spirit on color <laughs> preference, Berkeley versus Stanford. Yes. So let's back up just a little bit to okay. our theory about color preference. Okay. So Steve Palmer and I formulated this theory that color preferences are determined by all of our previous experiences with a particular color during our lifetime. So our preference for, say, this particular color blue would be determined by all of our experiences with that color blue. So if we have lots of positive experiences, we would come to like that blue more. And if we have lots of negative experiences, we would come to like it less. And so it's this combination of all of these positive and negative experiences that create this overall preference. So it's a summary statistic of our experience with colored objects. So um, we, in our original article, we found that you can explain 80% of the variance in average color preferences, so it's a good fit um, with average color preferences, by how positive versus negative objects are that are associated with the colors. And I can go into detail more about so can that. You, can you exp explain sure. that, that last sentence that you said? Sure. So <laughs> I certainly can. Um, so we had four different groups of participants. One of rated their preference for colored squares, much like this. So colored squares are what I spend most of my time thinking about, actually. Um, so they rated how much they like each color on a scale from not at all to very much. And then another group of participants saw the same colored squares, but their task was to describe all of the objects that they associated with each color, and they had about 20 seconds to do so. So this gave us a list of 4,000 object descriptions for our set of 32 colors, which we then combined and categorized, because some of them were very similar, like clear sky and clear blue sky was categorized as clear sky. Then we had another group of people see those object descriptions, so now it's just black text on a white background, and they rated how positive versus negative those objects are. So for these people, they didn't see colors in the experiment at all. All they're doing is judging how positive versus negative these objects were that were originally generated by seeing the colors. So then we took for each color the average of those positive versus negative ratings, um, for all of the objects that were associated with the color. So for a color like this, clear sky, clean water, and so forth. And that average of all of those objects is mm -hmm. what we call the wave, or the weighted effective valence estimate. So if you look at the wave for the colors um, and correlate that with people's color preferences, mm -hmm. the correlation is 0.89 in the mm -hmm. average data. Mm -hmm. So there's a strong relation mm -hmm. between how much people like colors mm -hmm. and how positive objects are that are associated with the colors. Mm -hmm. So this led to the idea that, well, people who are at Berkeley probably have positive feelings towards Berkeley colors, and to the extent mm. that they feel that Stanford is a rival, negative feelings towards Stanford colors, and vice versa. And so the idea is that this affiliation or positive affect towards Berkeley or a negative affect towards mm -hmm. Stanford is just one of those sorts mm -hmm. of object associations, like in that um, list that I described. Right. So that experiment that you did is sort of the, the core experiment that led you to this thesis that prior exactly. experience determines color preference. Exactly. And, yeah. and how long-lasting are those preferences based on experience? Are people who, who are at Cal going to hate red for the rest of their lives? <laughs> That's a good question. I don't know. We should study alum. <laughs> um, but we have in the lab tried to change people's color preferences by showing them, say, positive um, images of red mm -hmm. objects, so ripe fruit mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. flowers, mm -hmm. and negative images of green objects. Mm -hmm. I'll, just, I'll spare you the descriptions of what those pictures were, um, and mm -hmm. vice versa. And so we find that um, if we measure people's color preferences and then show them these objects, and they do various tasks with the objects, including rate how much they like those objects, mm -hmm. and then we measure their color preferences again, we mm -hmm. find systematic changes. So if you mm -hmm. see lots of positive red objects, preference for red increases, mm -hmm. and preference mm -hmm. for green slightly decreases after seeing the negative green objects and vice versa. Mm. So that works on at a given mm -hmm. testing session on one day. Mm. If we have people come back the next day, mm -hmm. the effect on average goes away, 
Mm. But the degree to which a given person was affected on the first day is correlated with the, how likely mm. the effect is to last mm. Um, mm. overnight. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is that if we have really strong experiences with um, these colored objects, it mm -hmm. will have a more long-lasting effect. Mm -hmm. And I imagine um, there's all kinds of parameters that influence um, what makes some objects be more influential, mm -hmm. and maybe mm -hmm. if there's a strong emotional experience. Mm -hmm. um, but those are all questions for future research that we're planning on right. looking at. So those factors could be... Um, associative, po poetic in fact. I mean, someone might have a positive color association to leaves because leaves remind them of a, po a, po a poem or sure. a poetic feeling. I mean, you, it's not necessarily because it's a leaf and they might be able to eat it. It's not necessarily a Darwinian kind of thing. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah. And what about, I mean, it's very interesting in terms of uh, the relationship between these positive experiences and color preference, but once you get into the realm of fine art, uh, you have this, you enter this slippery zone, particularly abstract art, where the, th the thing is the experience, and I would say that's, that's the case here. So, you know, your correlation is between sort of experiences with things and then color preference. What if the, ex the, exper the, the thing is an experience? So you go into a... Uh, uh, a museum or, or have a, you know, see, see a painting that is, say, just green, um, and you enter into that green feeling mm -hmm. um, in some way, at least in an in a art way of thinking, apart from, an, uh, uh, you know, you wouldn't say that that experience has to do with, I saw a, a painted object in a museum. Uh, it's really about absorbing green in an interior way. That doesn't conflict at all with your theory. It's just another way of experiencing a thing and having a positive or negative connection with it. Right, so I think there's two parts to that. One is that when you experience that green painting, or we can talk about blue paintings because they're behind mm -hmm. us. And when you experience this blue painting, I think you, because all there is there is color, it right. invites the observer to think rather than just passively observe. So they think, well, what what is this? What does this make me think of? And so I think this, like in our experiments, where we present a colored square on a solid mm -hmm. background, people are th when people are thinking about what this thing reminds them of, I think people do start to think, well, what is this? And they might mm -hmm. actually consciously think of those associations mm -hmm. that they have. But then their experience with this colored objects, object would then mm -hmm. go and influence their preference for that mm -hmm. color in the future. Mm -hmm. So if this um, conversation was particularly exciting for you and um, you were left with a strong emotional positive experience, mm -hmm. let's hope, then you might come to like this color more because mm -hmm. you would associate this whole experience mm -hmm. with that color. Um, or if you're totally bored and miserable, then mm -hmm. you would come to like it less. Right. So I think there's two aspects of it. It's the experience and then it feeds back into the overall right. preference for the color. And is not only the preference for color, but the experience of color always associative? Is, is it, you know, would you say it's impossible to even perceive this color without a, f a framework of association? It's a great question. I don't know. I think there's different levels of um, consciousness of the association. So in the task where we have people judge their color preferences, um, we hope that they're just, you know, making a impulsive judgment about how much mm. they like it. In a task where we invite them to talk, think about all of the objects they associate, then it's much more conceptual. And a question of what people are actually doing when they simply look at a color is an interesting question. And I imagine there's large individual differences. Mm -hmm. So some people who don't think about color much might be saying, that's the color. <laughs> and mm -hmm. other people who are more interested in color and think about color more might have a more complex mm -hmm. experience. Mm -hmm. And there might, even for the people who are not reflective, uh, there could be functional associations happening on an unconscious level, and you could test for that somehow. 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 Um, <laughs> so these, of course, one of the wonderful things about these paintings is they're not, you know, um, a, they're not, in fact, a single color. They're not out of the tube, um, you know, colors. They're actually the, the experience of perceiving them is the experience of perceiving layers of transparent color. So underneath what appears to be a square of monochrome blue, there may be layers of red and green and, and yellow, and one in fact perceives some of this complexity that's part of the, the ultimate perception. You could say, well, that's a blue painting. In fact, uh, the longer you look at it, you, especially in contrast to some of the others, you begin to see some of these nuances. 
Does that play, uh, you know, what role does that kind of complexity of color experience have in the theory that, that you're working with? I think, first of all, it's to the extent that people actually do perceive that. And so an interesting experience or experiment would be to have a painting that's exactly the same size where you match the color experience and paint that and see if people can actually see the difference. Mm -hmm. I imagine if they do, it's a sort of textural experience. So possibly that element of translucency would cause people to think more about the translucent blue objects rather than solid ones. So maybe more mm -hmm. about oceans. And so the, mm -hmm. that sort of experience would come to affect their preference mm -hmm. or experience for the painting more. So I think um, colors exist on surfaces most of the time. And so different surface properties might influence the sorts of color associations people have for the particular object. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenneth Baker, the art critic for the Chronicle, when he was writing about this show, particularly uh, identified the experience of juxtaposition, that, that one's experience of these colors is different or sort of meaningful and interesting in part because of the experience one has going from one painting to the other and thereby noticing subtleties. You know, if you saw this on its own, you wouldn't maybe notice its paleness as much as if you didn't see it next to the work on the right, which is slightly darker. Um, have, has your field looked at all into this kind of, uh, you know, adjacencies or the issues of comparison uh, between colors? We've looked at preferences for color combinations, and usually they're, they're touching or in an um, mm. arrangement with a large square with a small square in them. Um, but we do find that, uh, so this, this exhibit as a whole would be very harmonious. You've got very similar hues and different lightness levels. And so um, that overall experience um, requires seeing all of them at once to get that mm. feeling of harmoniousness. Um, and colors in general, um, if you look at a, a single color for a long time and your whole field is that color, the color will disappear mm. because the visual system mm. adapts. So our experience of color relies on comparisons mm. with other colors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think this um, exhibit kind of illuminates that. And so mm. you, you can appreciate the, the contrast between the colors in this way. And I imagine the way that you've, out, you've organized the paintings mm -hmm. would also impact the way people perceive mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. So if you have um, that light blue next to the gray, it's going to look more vivid than if you put that light blue mm -hmm. next to one of the more saturated colors. And so mm -hmm. I think it's really interesting that um, Decreeness allows the curator to mm -hmm. play with the mm -hmm. paintings almost as blocks to create mm -hmm. another level of color mm -hmm. mixture on top of what's on the paintings alone. Mm -hmm. And so what has your research shown about, uh, I mean, if there are any sort of simple conclusions about color juxtaposition uh, and what's pleasant and what isn't, is it just that harmonious colors are, people like them better? Are there surprising discoveries in that? Right, so in the art history and art theory literature and also in some of the psychology literature, people conflate the terms preference and harmony mm. um, where they're, they're used basically to, to capture overall pleasingness, but they're, they're really used interchangeably. And so my dissertation work was largely on understanding the difference between preference and harmony for color combinations. So we find that preferences for color combinations um, are strongly related to harmony. The correlation is about 0.76. Um, however, there's, um, there are market differences. So one is that harmony doesn't depend on how much you like the component colors. So light beige and dark beige is really harmonious, but mm. people are kind of meh about mm. the colors. Mm -hmm. Whereas preference for a color combination mm. depends on mm -hmm preference for the component colors. There's also more lightness contrast in preference. So generally more similar colors are more harmonious, but preference has more contrast and more preferable component colors. In um, classic art the or color theory, people have talked about harmony of analogous colors, so colors that are similar to each other. So say green with um, bluish green um, versus harmony of contrast, so say green with red. And we find when you ask people to judge a color combination as a whole, um, they do not like contrasting colors, with the exception of blue and yellow, but we're at Berkeley, so it's hard to know. Mm. <laughs> um, but generally, people do not like contrasting colors as a whole. So that's in contradiction to? It's in contradiction uh, to, so, right, so Chevrolet proposed harmony of analogous colors and harmony of contrast. Itten only talked about harmony of contrast. So for him, colors were harmonious. If you took 
paint and spun them on a wheel and they mixed to make gray, then they were harmonious, so very contrasting colors. Mm. And he was wrong. Well, he was wrong in terms of preference for color combination as a whole. Mm. But what we also did was looked for, um, we looked at preference for a single color given its background color. So imagine on here a small square inside and people judge their preference for the small square given the background. Mm. And there we find evidence that people like colors on contrasting backgrounds. Mm. So there's a difference between mm. preference for the, uh, the color combination mm -hmm. as a whole and mm. preference for a mm. figural color mm. given its background. So mm. in the context of paintings, mm. um, when you would want to use one versus another depends mm. on what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to make a figure really stand out against the background, and you don't care necessarily about the harmoniousness of the painting as a whole, but mm. you want that, that red rose to be brilliant. You mm. want to put it on a green background to make it really stand out. Um, but if you want to say make a harmonious sunset, then having mm. more similar colors would be a more mm. harmonious overall feeling. Mm -hmm. So what, what are some of the burning issues in color perception research right now? What's the unanswered <laughs> question? Well, in, in our work, the unanswered question is, a, a big unanswered question is how these um, experiences with objects all are combined, or these color experiences are combined to produce preference for a color. So like we talked about before, um, in the lab, if we show people some ripe strawberries, it can increase their preference for a little bit of time, but not for long. So the question is, how are these color preferences developing and changing over time? We know that infants have very different color preferences from adults. So the correlation when they look at the same colors, um, and they we look at infant looking biases um, and adult preferences, um, the correlation is like point negative 0.4, so it's a reliable negative correlation. And the color that adults like least, which is dark yellow, we call it yucky poo uh, color, um, is among the most preferred for infants. Mm. So what's happening wow. over <laughs> their lifetimes that they come to like it less? Um, wow. Yeah, so how all these experiences are combined. We also recently found that color preferences seem to be very dynamic, more so than we knew before. So we looked at color preferences over the political season this year, mm. and so we measured them before the election, on election day, and after. And we looked at Democrats and Republicans separately. And we find systematic differences where Republicans like red more, but only on election day. Mm. So what that's suggesting is that our color preference at a given moment in time mm. is calculated. So if I ask you right now how much do you like red, it, and I'll show you a particular shade of red, it's going to be calculated based on what sorts of object associations are mm. more relevant or active right mm. now. And so how all of these things combine mm. to produce color preferences is an and interesting And in this question. case, it's not so much an object association as a value association or a, a context say, association. Yeah, so but, we say but, object. Right. And we mean right. object entities, any sort of association. They, right. It started with purely objects, and we actually excluded any sort of symbolic association. Mm -hmm. So we excluded things like Christmas or mm -hmm. peace. Um, but now we're looking in China, where there are strong symbolic associations of colors, to see how they contribute separately from the object associations. Um, mm -hmm. And so we don't, we're just collecting data as we mm -hmm. speak. So we're not sure um, what the results are yet, mm -hmm. but we imagine that in a culture where symbolic associations are important, those symbolic associations mm -hmm. are going to play into color preferences as well. So when I say object, it really um, is any sort of any sort of associate of a color, mm -hmm. anything a color reminds you of. So there's work like this that I think very successfully, for me anyway, um, sort of play, plays the uh, you know that the card of uh, giving me something I really just love. I just love these colors. But there's other kinds of art where the artist intentionally is giving you like the yucky poo color and saying. How do you like me now? And sometimes you like that yucky poo, even though you hate it. So how do you deal with that? Like, you like it, but you hate it. So art is a whole different can of worms from aesthetic response of single colored squares in the laboratory. Okay. So we don't Good. begin to say that we're understanding art at all. I guarantee mm. that no one would consider our color. I, I don't think people would consider the colored squares that we're studying on a great background as art. Um, because art has so many other factors. There's cultural factors, economic factors, um, the idea of of breaking expectations and mm. wanting that experience in a museum to, to be, have expectations violated. So mm. there's, there's so many um, components that um, mm. I, I wouldn't say that we're even studying art. Mm -hmm. Yet. 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 <laughs> uh, so I want to, you know, maybe violate scientific protocol by asking you which of these paintings is your favorite? Oh, wow. <laughs> I think probably that one. That one. 
and why? Why? I like saturated colors. I think that's, I, I could appeal to clear blue sky, um, mm. but I think it's probably more complex than that. Mm. Um, but if, if I'm just gonna give my immediate aesthetic mm -hmm. response, at least mm -hmm. th right now, that's the mm -hmm. one that I would mm -hmm. say. Great, good. Well, do you have any questions for me? I do. Oh boy. I have a, I have a potentially blasphemous question. Okay. Um, so these are solid, relatively speaking, homogenous colored surfaces. There are other paintings like Klein, who, or Klein Blue, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. theirs are also blue surfaces. Mm -hmm. So how would you characterize these as different from those? I noticed in the book that it's blasphemous to even mm -hmm. relate these mm -hmm. to, to Klein, Klein, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I think there's a number of reasons. I, I, I won't comment on whether it's blasphemous or not, or whether you're going to like go to hell now that you've said this, but um, uh, <laughs> I'll leave that to others to decide. Okay. But uh, the differences between these works and Klein's are, uh, first of all, the, the Klein was a single consistent color. Um, now that color probably, I'm not sure exactly the sort of chemistry mechanics of it, but you could, pr it probably was composed of different pigments because of course there were different blues and that blue probably had some yellow in it and some green different proportions and if you looked at it at a molecular level, it probably would break down into different components. So just as these have different colors that compose the blue, Klein blue probably did also but it would have been colors that were adjacent to one another, not on top of each other. So there's a different kind of mechanical way in which the color comes into your eye. And I believe that if you look at these paintings, that's not only a subliminal experience, this, the, the layered thing, but you can actually see it in some of the paintings. If you look at them, you can sort of see that there is a color underneath the top blue layer. So it is a, you know, just a, a different, um, experience visually and more more complex um, in terms of the perception of, of color and layered color. Uh, a couple of other differences in terms of the you know the artistic in, intent or uh, practice and also the experience of the viewer when there are multiple pieces of course is that the Klein was always consistent. The Klein blue was you know uh, branded and made to be consistent forever uh, and you could mix it or someone could mix it and do it again and again and again. Whereas uh, it was uh, de Crinius's intent and we see it demonstrated here that each painting be different and that difference is a critical component of the experience of the work when you see more than one obviously. Um, and then thirdly is uh, and this doesn't really have to do with color but it's the way the paint is is applied. Uh, and I think that the, the texture of application and the quality of the surface is critical to the experience of this color. And you talked before, actually, maybe it is related to color or the experience of color, that there's a difference between a clear color and association to like the sea versus a blue plate or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here it's blue, yes, but it's a smooth blue, we could call it, which is, you know, Klein had certain kinds of surfaces that were different from these surfaces. So it's the relationship between color and materiality that I think is, is important also. So why blue? Why blue for De mm -hmm. Uh Well, he didn't only do blue, he did gray obviously. Uh, there was actually even, I saw in his studio, a red painting. Oh. There was a red painting. Um, uh, I believe that he was I wouldn't say in love with, I think he loved the sky. Um, he, um, his studio was in New York City, which is actually known by some artists for having a particularly intense blue sky. Louise Bourgeois used to talk about how when she came from Europe to New York, she, the thing that impressed her most besides the skyscrapers was the sky, and she loved the color blue also uh, because of its resonance in, in New York City. Um, and I think that he loved that as well. And, um, you know, these were all painted in the natural light of his studio, which was like on the 10th floor of a building in New York, lots of, you know, sky. I think he loved the sky. Uh, I wonder if the um, special preference for sky in New York, it's the same sky that's not in New York. And so I wonder if mm. it's like the aspect of nature that you can get anywhere. Mm. Well, I think, I think these people would say, and Louise Bourgeois would 
said, I had never talked mm -hmm. to Rudolph, so I don't know, that the sky in New York is different. Um, maybe, and I, you know, it's different in San Francisco too. You notice it's something yeah. about bounce, they talk about bounce, the lights yeah. bouncing off the ocean or something like that. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know what it is. I've noticed that the, the sky is different in Philadelphia than it is in New York too. It's yellower. Why is that? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. um, and it could be the angle of the sun and that okay. place on the earth or the relationship between land and ocean. I, I don't know. But uh, several artists have commented to me on New York skies. Interesting. So. We're great. <laughs> Any other questions? If not, I'll open it up. Yes. Yeah, in the beginning, um, you commented, and Karen started to present her theory that when you look at a color, your preference for it, whether that's aesthetics or not, was related to all these things associations, memories, values, objects, and so on. And you commented that, kind of on a different point of view, I think, that the, the experiencing the art itself was somehow this aesthetic experience. So to me, I, I have trouble understanding that how I can have an experience if I took away my, uh, my whole lifetime my associations, conscious and unconscious values and values. So can you elaborate on, on what that is? So how can I how can I come in here and not have any concept of skies or oceans or and, and yeah, that, that's not exactly what I, what I was trying to get at, and it's, it'll be hard for me to describe what I was trying to get at, and I, and I realized that what, you're, what you imagine I was getting at is in, would be the antithesis of what your research has shown to be true. Uh, and I, I suppose, um, you know, what I'm trying to describe is maybe closer to an artistic intention in a particular period and style of work that I think is, to generalize, trying to bring viewers' experience closer to a present moment, as opposed to, say, your typical painting, which describes something that happened previously or elsewhere. And particularly minimalist art was premised on the idea of situating people, giving them a self-awareness of their present state, their, their kinesthetic, relationship to objects in space or in, in the case of paintings that have to do with color, with color perception. Um, how that relates to, you know, the experience of association, I, I don't know, but it's maybe, um, you know, it relates to, to your question that it's about uh, bringing into awareness in the viewer the relationship between past association and pr what we could call present experience or kinesthetic, the, this sort of mind-body thing. But I, I don't know. Uh, but I think it does have something to do with artistic intention, generally speaking. Steve? This is another piece of, of the same kind of general issue. If you go back to like Kant and look at his definition of aesthetics, one of the important components is that it's disinterested. It's not, it's not about you know, wanting something that tastes better or, or something that keeps you warm or mm -hmm. things like that. It's disinterested mm -hmm. in this way. And I think one of the interesting uh, points that Karen's made uh, from our research is that well, even these disinterested preferences for just colored squares isn't really disinterested in that way. It, it's really grounded a lot in actual memories, of your, I don't want to say memories, but experiences mm -hmm. uh, with, that you've had with mm -hmm. uh, objects which were interested mm -hmm. interactions, right? You know, you like the blue sky because you like it mm -hmm. to be sunny out and you get to go out and play when you were a kid or, or whatever, all those positive associations, they're, they're in, that's not purely aesthetic in a sort of Kantian sense, because mm -hmm. um, there's something instrumental about it, right? But, but that all kind of um, blends together in our brains and minds when we're looking at things and have an aesthetic response, to really a lot of it seems to be grounded in that stuff as well. So it's an interesting juxtaposition of sort of what are some of the classical ideas about aesthetics and how it relates to preference. Could saw another yeah. Yeah. Has any research been done how people with Alzheimer's experience color? 
So it's because of the that they're never sure. sure. That's a really interesting question. So if, or I think a case of amnesia would be a cleaner um, study because then if all, so with Alzheimer's there's the issue of whether or not they can, they have access to the question that we're asking them um, of how much do you like this thing if, they're, if their approach to that question is the same. But in, ca in a case of amnesia where um, if you could have someone's color preferences um, documented and then they get amnesia so they lose those memories and possibly those associations, will their color preferences change dramatically? I think is an, a really interesting question. Um, and for Alzheimer's, if you lose all access to previous associations with colors, yeah, I don't know. That's, that's a very interesting question. Uh, um, if your notion about experiencing, you know, your preference for color is based on experience, then how would you account for, you refer to infants, infant period, right? having decided color preferences? So there's a couple of things. First, um, when we say infant color preferences, I shouldn't say this is looking biases. So we can't say, how much do you like this when they're five months old? Um, so, right, but yes, exactly. And these are, th are controlled for things that usually attract attention like contrast. Um, so infants who are five months old have five months of experience with the world. So they have five months of experience with colored objects. They, um, they generally like pink and dark yellow most. Pink is the color of mom's lips and skin, um, possibly nipple color. Um, the dark yellow, depending on your own pigmentation, or um, bottle nipple colors. Um, and so we have a lot, a lot of work to do to try to understand that. Um, one question is if you um, give, if you can do an intervention study. So you give infants, um, say, um, one color of bottle nipple versus another, will that influence their color preference? Um, if we look at infants from different cultural Back, so if mom has very dark skin versus light skin, will infants prefer color, the color of mom's skin more than another skin color? Um, and one thing that I'm planning on doing is there's, there's footage of infant experience there with a head-mounted camera of what infants are actually seeing for a very prolonged amount of time. So it's going to be really interesting to look at what infants, what's really in infants' ecological world, or we call it an ecological map. Right, so what, what it is that they even see, is we don't know what they're paying attention to, but we can tell what their eyes are at least looking at um, from this sort of head-mounted camera and try to document what that is and, and if it changes depending on um, what they can do. So if they have reaching behavior, if once they can turn their head, does their color experience change and so forth? Great, so I think we'll take two more questions and then... Um, <laughs> who uh, had color blindness always shows the most beautiful colors, you know, subtle mauve, the most elegant pink, whatever it is, his Christmas gifts to us. How does he do this, you know? If he's colorblind, he makes choices. Somebody else wasn't making the choices for him. He didn't ask the person at the store? Okay. <laughs> his own choices. And then it, it conflated with the fact that um, he flew planes, and so he couldn't be in the Air Force earlier because he was colorblind. So have you addressed, you know, like being, uh, some people are tone deaf, you know, like can hear and listen to music, and people who are colorblind and can look at colors, have you addressed that component? Is that factor in the So what is color blind is a, um, a, is a, there's different types of color blindness. So the most um, typical type is protonopia or deuteronopia, where you're missing either the long wavelength sensitive cone or the medium wavelength sensitive cone. And in those cases, um, there's still color experience, so it's not like the whole world is black and white. So everything is in shades of, um, from basically yellow to blue with the grays in between. So it could have been the case that his, um, what he liked mapped on to a color that happened to be a color that you like, like the pink. Um, it's also possible, so these different colors vary in lightnesses, so even though he might not have had the same color experience or chromatic experience as you, um, he might know what color you like based on what you've said, and he knows what that experience looks like for him, and then could match that in the store. Um, so there's certain yeah, so there's certain, con there are confusions between um, 
specific colors where he might he wouldn't see the difference between two colors that you clearly would. Um, but he probably used other cues like lightness and the amount of um, chromatic information he did have to match what he knew you liked is what I would guess. Right, yes. Let's see if I can formulate something here. I like to talk about or hear from you about the, um, uh, the meaning of uh, experience itself, the experience itself, the, the quality according to you, the quality of colors is not in the color per se. And it also is not in, in my free, uh, free brain, my free mind, it's something between my experience, is doing this bridge between these two entities, right? Then can you classify, uh, you are trying to classify all this, this experience, what it is experience for you, it's, what it is experience, you know, this being of experience that is between us, you know, between my relation with the colors. I don't know if you oh my. To be... <laughs> I, mean, I think the question of what is experience is a deep philosophical question that I don't think I have a very good answer to. I do think that when I say experience in terms of past experiences with colored objects, um, that's a matter of you seeing the object and having some sort of response to it based on your emotional state, based on your motivations, based on what, whatever cognitive um, states you're bringing to your, your looking at that color. And so I think your experience of a color is a combination of what's happening when these wavelengths excite your photoreceptors and get transduced into um, color experience through the visual system, plus your cognitive associations and um, thoughts that you combine to produce this um, whole experience based on um, all of these things. So when I say experience, I think it's really the interplay between the physical stimulus, which itself, I would argue, doesn't have color in it. It has light that gets reflected at various wavelengths, and then your visual system produces that color. Um, so it's that combined with all of your previous knowledge and associations and so forth that are going to influence your experience. And what you looked at just before. So if you, uh, you made the interesting comment before that if you look at one of these paintings for a while, um, you're going to have an after image. So if you look at a painting for a while and look at the white background, you'll probably see yellow. So then when you go from this painting to this one with that, um, then this painting is going to look less saturated or it's going to look more grayish because you've got the yellowness from the after image combining with the wavelengths that are coming from this painting. So I think all of these things combined are going to influence experience in a really complex and interesting way. Well, thank you, Karen. This Me has too. been absolutely fascinating, <laughs> and uh, I hope you can stick around for a few minutes. Maybe people will have a few questions to ask sure. you informally. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Book signing. Oh, oh my goodness. Okay. Off we go to the book signing. I think <laughs> you have to buy a book, though. I'm not just going to sign random books. Okay. <laughs> thank you, everybody.